Welcome this morning as we gather around God's Word. My name is David Morton. I'm one of the members here at Breton Baptist Church, and it's my privilege to be sharing with you this morning. Before we start our time together, let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come together to think about the meaning of the church, would you speak into our hearts and our minds? Would you reveal to us what you want us to to think about what you want us to question, or how you want us to think about church, both now in the present and moving into the future. Would you be with us now by your Holy Spirit? In Jesus' name, amen. This is the second week of a series looking at church, what it's looked like in the past, what it looks like now, and what we imagine it might look like in the future. This week, we're seeking to understand the meaning of the church, or to put it another way, to ask the question, what does church mean to you? So how do you see church? If I was to ask you right now, what image comes to mind when you think of church? What would you think of? Maybe you think of Brown Baptist Church, maybe a building that you've visited recently, the church you were married in or baptised in, Maybe you'll think of the people who you come to church with, sit with on a Sunday morning. Maybe you think of your connect group. Or maybe you think about the denomination you were brought up in, the Anglican church, the Methodist church, or the Baptist church. I'm sure at some point in the past, you will have made up a fortune teller just like this one. Now, if you know me and how unpractical I am, I'm sure you're quite amazed to, to hear that I actually made this myself the first time ever and didn't rely on Debbie to make it for me. Within a single fortune teller, you can include a number of different quest questions, images or colours. Now, this image of a number of different facets or faces being contained within a single entity is a useful picture for us when we start to think about what the church means to us. So today we're going to think about five different pictures of church that we can find in the Bible and how ask ourselves how they are reflected in Bread and Baptist Church right now and how they can inspire us to reimagine what church might look like in the 21st century. Our five biblical pictures of church are helpfully described by Alistair McGrath in his book Christian Theology and are the people of God, a community of salvation, the body of Christ, a servant people, and a community of the Spirit. So let's start by looking at the church as the people of God. The Apostle Peter has something to say about the church. Let's listen to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. As the people of God, we're told, you have been chosen by God. You are called to serve, you are set apart to worship him, you belong to God. Let's just hear that again. You have been chosen by God. You are called to serve. You are set apart to worship him. You belong to God. Being part of the people of God is not dependent on your race, who your parents are, the colour of your skin, your gender, your sexuality, your social status or wealth. It's absolutely mind blowing. Being part of the people of God is only dependent on one thing, profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. As Galatians 3.26 reminds us, for in Christ Jesus, we are all children of God through faith. From the starting point of the church, it has grown and continues to grow. And it's good for us to remember the church as the people of God is not just a collective of individuals joined together around a shared vision or belief. 
as Rich two weeks ago and Brian last week said, we share a lineage. God is our father and we are precious to him. We are family. As the people of God here in Breton, this shared lineage binds us together. It gives us a common identity, commits us to each other's mutual flourishing and leads us together to proclaim the mighty acts of him who called us out of darkness into his marvellous light. Sam Wells, Vicar of St Martin in the field, expresses this beautifully. But to be church, rather than to simply be a person who combines with others to worship, means to participate in the daily practices of forming and restoring a local body of people and helping it to flourish in the unique calling the Holy Spirit has given us as a church. Sometimes when I'm at church, <clears throat> at the end of the service, I will sit back and watch people over coffee. What I see is church, our church, Breton Baptist Church, is the people of God. I see people who would never ever be in the same room together, bond over a love of God and a desire to serve him, to bring about new life in others. I love this about the expression of church that is Breton Baptist Church. A collection of people, the people of God, calls together for this time, for God's purpose, each to, with a part to play in shaping and forming the kingdom of God, each reliant, often without realising it, on the character and giftings of others. But what does the church as the people of God mean to you? There'll be an opportunity to reflect on this in our connect groups and through the accompanying notes to this sermon, which you can get hold of through the church office. So having looked at the church as the people of God, let's move on to our second picture, the church as a community of salvation. The church is called into being both in response to the work of God and as a means of proclaiming the work of God. Let's listen to two extracts from Matthew's Gospel. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. Matthew chapter 5 verses 13 to 16 Salt and Light You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Seeing the church as a community of salvation can be for many of us. I think if we're really honest, more challenging. We're comfortable with our own personal salvation, our own personal faith, and the church is a place where the saved gather together, but can be less comfortable with the picture of the church as an active agent of God's salvation plan. Today's secular society forces faith and expression into the personal realm. People will say, well, you worship if you want to, but don't involve me. Our light is placed under a bowl for us by a society who no longer honours a relationship with God, nor sees the transformational impact it has on our individual lives or communities. This can have a real impact on sharing our faith and how we evangelise. Both become a challenge. So how do we remain faithful to the calling God has placed upon us to be salt and light? 
How can we rediscover the natural art of talking about Jesus and his love for us? This is an area where still, after 30 years as a Christian, I still struggle. My introverted, fearful self shies away from sharing what is one of the most precious gifts I've ever been given. When I read Spurgeon proclaim, it is the whole business of the whole church to preach the whole gospel to the whole world. I can quite frankly be overwhelmed. And when I read Jim Packer's state, the task of the church is to make the invisible kingdom visible through faithful Christian living and witness bearing. I can take refuge in faithful Christian living and quietly, stubbornly ignore the call to bear witness. But God calls us to a different way. So what can I do? I want to evangelise, I want to worship, I want to witness, but I find it difficult. There is no easy answer, but I think the starting point seems to me to lie in open and honest prayer. It certainly seems to me to be what the Bible says. To ask for the words to say, the courage to say them, and the God-given opportunities to simply share faith. As our readings remind us, we have authority in the name of Jesus. His presence is with us wherever we go. As a church, we now enter a new season. Let's have the confidence to walk in it and to openly and honestly and genuinely have the confidence to share our faith with others. Stuart Townend in Salvation Song sums up beautifully what salvation means to me. Loved before the dawn of time, chosen by my maker, hidden in my saviour, I am his and he is mine, cherished for eternity. When I'm stained with guilt and sin, he is there to lift me, heal me and forgive me, gives me strength to stand again, stronger than I was before. May we as a church together, both corporately and individually, sing salvation songs and may God, as a result, Give us a harvest of new believers to sing with. Our third image is that of the church of the body of Christ. And the church of the body of Christ is probably one of the most familiar pictures we know of when we think about the church. Let's listen to our next reading. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 to 13 and 27 to 31. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptised into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. This has both spiritual and temporal aspects. 
As a body, we have been provided by Christ with everything we need to flourish and to grow. We are bound together in love and that love compels us to reach out to those in need of the gospel and to each other. We're interdependent. We rely on each other as we all have different God-given gifts so we might build up the body of Christ, his church. What gift has God given you for the benefit of his church? What God gift has God given you for the benefit of his body? How is he calling you to use it for his glory and to build his kingdom? What does being part of the body of Christ mean to you? As I've shared before, serving communion is one of the greatest blessings I've experienced as a member of Bretton Baptist Church. It's such a joy to see the people of God in all its diversity, complexity, amidst the joys and challenges of life, draw together around the Lord's table. In those simple emblems, the bread and the wine, and what they represent, the body of Christ broken for us, and the blood of Christ shed for us, we find forgiveness, acceptance, healing, and we also find unity. For the table is for all who love the Lord Jesus. There are no exceptions, and that is what the church is called to live out and to be. A church for all, one body, the body of Christ. So it is at that point, gathered around the communion table, that the church is the body of Christ is truly visible to me. So how is the body of Christ visible to you at Bratton? Is it in the diversity of the church community, in your experience of body ministry, or in your receiving loving care from the body in a time of difficulty? How can we better reflect the fact that we are the body of Christ? How can we share this with each other, both in word and in deed? So three pictures that reflect the body of Christ. And our fourth picture is that of the church as a servant people. Second Corinthians chapter four, verses five to seven. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. So what does it mean to you to be part of the servant people of God? I don't know about you, but I would imagine that you'll be breathing a sigh of relief at our fourth image. Serving others, doing things, seems to be a comfortable place for Christians to find themselves. There's something kind of tangible, concrete, accessible about serving others. There's a comfort in doing things, in caring for those in need, and in doing so reflecting the love of Christ. But in our fourth picture, we start to learn rather like our paper fortune teller, that the different pictures of church are interconnected. And in the picture of the church as a servant people, the individual pictures of church all start to merge together. The pictures that God gives us of church are not exclusive. It's not one or the other, it's all of them together. Different facets of the same whole. For from the very first moment that the church was formed, God called it to a radical model of service, to give without thought of cost, to go places where others would not go, to serve others, those who the community would not serve through fear or through prejudice. So when I ask, when I ask what it means to be a servant people, when the church asks what it means to be a servant people, I have to be, and we have to be, very careful. Serving others is not about making me feel good about myself, 
or presenting myself as a patron of the poor or the vulnerable. It's not about the church making itself look good in the eyes of society. It is all about witnessing to the love of God and to further his kingdom. For as our reading says, for what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as servants for Jesus' sake. Our motives must be pure and clearly focused on Jesus and our vision wide enough to encompass what God calls us to be and what God calls us to do. God's call to service led Jackie Pollinger to the drug dens of Hong Kong, Nicky Cruz to the gangs of New York. God's call to service led Mother Teresa to commit herself to ensuring that people did not die in the gutter on the streets of Calcutta. God chooses you and he chooses me for service. He calls the church for service. Where is he calling you to serve him today? Where does he want you to be a blessing to others, to share the good news of the kingdom of God? Tim Hughes' song, God of Justice, sums this up well. God of Justice, saviour to all, came to rescue the weak and the poor, came to serve and not be served. And Jesus, you have called us, Freely we've received, now freely we will give. We must go, live to feed the hungry, stand beside the broken. We must go, stepping forward, keep us from just singing, move us into action. We must go, live to feed the hungry, stand beside the broken. Stepping forward, move us into action. Our final picture then is of the church as a community of the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 to 6 As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. The presence of the Holy Spirit enables the church to witness and to grow. It is a sign of the coming of God's kingdom. As N.T. Wright comments, without God's spirit, there is nothing we can do that will count for God's kingdom. Without God's spirit, the church simply cannot be the church. So what does being a community of the spirit mean to you? How do you see the church here in Breton opening itself to the Holy Spirit? How will we allow God, through the Spirit, speak to us through words of prophecy and words of wisdom? Debbie and I have been part of the Fellowship of Breton here now for nearly 20 years, and there are those amongst us who have been members since day one. And as I reflect on the last 20 years, I can see one thing very clearly. At that point, throughout the whole of the 20-year period, there has not been a single year when the membership of our church has not changed. As people have come or gone, the church under God's guidance has changed and evolved, exploring what it means to be a community of those who love Jesus, love others, and want to love Jesus more. The constant melting pot of people's giftings, calling, and human experience leads the church to constantly partner with God in his mission in new ways. Now, most organisations would wither and die under such consistent and persistent change. But Breton Baptist Church hasn't. As Brian said last week, the church hasn't withered or died either. Why is this? Because at the heart of the change and the heart of the continuity 
is the Holy Spirit. God speaks into the life of his church through his Holy Spirit. He spoke at the outset of the church. He has spoken throughout the history of the church. He speaks now and he will speak into the future. So where do you see the Holy Spirit at work in Breton Baptist Church? How is the church moving in our community? What is he saying to you as an individual and as a church? So five biblical pictures of church. The church is the people of God, as a community of salvation, the body of Christ, a servant people, a community of the spirit. Five pictures that form a bigger picture that has influenced the church of the past, the church of the present, and will, under God's guidance, affect how we see church in the future. As the church of the future seeks to faithfully be the church that God calls it to be. What this will look like in Breton is down to you and to me to discern what God is saying and be courageous enough to act on it will be a challenge. But it is a challenge that we can be confident that God has equipped us to deal with. His spirit is with us. Are you, as Sam Wells suggests, willing to make your life transparent to others? Are you prepared to do humble and simple tasks? Accept that your control insistence on your own way and the right to be offended will all be in jeopardy. But at the same time, are you prepared to be part of a movement following in Christ's footsteps? Have your eyes opened to miracles of healing and transformation? And are be ready to meet Christ face to face? In short, are you prepared to be one body? Be church. Will you join me in praying, not just now, but in the coming weeks and months? Together, let's ask God to act, to reveal his heart for the church, to grow his church, not just for our benefit, but for his glory. Let us pray. Lord, we just thank you for your church. We thank you that over the decades, over the centuries, over the millennia, your church has not just survived, but has thrived and has grown. We thank you for the expression of church that is Bretton Baptist Church. Lord, we just ask you now, would you come and reveal yourself to us, reveal how you want us to be church in the 21st century. And may it all be for your glory.